All right, so uh, we've only got 20 minutes, and I kind of have to explain a little bit about cable for everybody to kind of understand what we're doing. So, uh, but that, I'm assuming most of you are all pretty familiar with what these things are. Um, but have you ever wondered how they work? I mean, how, how does cable actually come across this and get to your, to your house? So we've been talking a lot about Kubernetes the past few days, um, but we're gonna quickly detour for just a couple minutes and talk about how cable works and circle back for Kubernetes. So television actually started out as just a couple of channels broadcast using radio waves and picked up by antennas attached to your television set. And probably depending on the age, how old you are and kind of the city you grew up in, you probably remember having to screw with the antenna just to get your favorite station to come in. And in the true hacker spirit, you may have even built your own high-tech antenna. But if you lived in a hilly area without line of sight to the transmission tower, you really didn't have the ability to get cable until a man in the, uh, I think it was back in the 40s, a gentleman uh, that was selling TV sale, uh, TVs had a problem selling TVs because he couldn't sell them to customers because they, no they got no TV reception due to hills uh, from the mountains. So basically went up into the mountains, set up a tower, ran coax cable down to his store, and then eventually out to his customers, and then we got cable TV. It was known as community antenna TV back then. Uh, and by the 80s, it was available throughout most of the United States. If we fast forward to the late 90s, digital cable was introduced. Oops. So digital cable was introduced, and it offered a number of advantages, first of which was that we could multiplex many channels under the same analog frequency, allowing for everybody to get more stations. It also offered things like error correction, compression, and encryption. And it brought a welcome end to dial-up internet. Does anybody here remember that terrible sound when you, call it, when you had to dial up the internet? OK, so I'm not the only one. It haunts my dreams. <laughs> so today, digital video actually starts out as multicast UDP traffic from Comcast National Data Centers. And it's, it goes across basically Comcast's own cable backbones that we refer to as C-bones into more than 30 converged regional area networks. And we refer to those as CRANs for short. So within those networks, they're actually composed of a number of locations, two primary locations where all of our internet, phone, and cable backbones come into. And th those are locations are collectively referred to as the head end. And they provide kind of redundancy at the backbone le level in case a fiber gets cut or power outages on one side or the other. In addition, to the, within those locations, we have a piece of hardware that's kind of industry specific known as a CAP, or this specific model is a CAP 1000. And this piece of hardware is responsible for taking multiple uh, video streams injecting localized ads so that on your side of town you get uh, you know, the car salesmanship that's around the corner and not the one that's on the other side of town. It then multiplexes those streams together and creates one stream, encrypts them, and then sends them out to the smaller locations that we refer to as hub sites. So we typically have a redundant set of these CAP 1000s on each side of the head end, both multicasting towards the hub site, so in case one uh, gets cut off. There can be any number of these hub sites. I only have a couple of them from the Seattle area represented here. So once the stream reaches the hub site, it makes its way to another piece of hardware known as the Apex. So what the Apex does is it takes this multicast traffic, it watches both IP addresses over source-specific multicast, and it, mo it measures the bit rate of the streams, and if the bit rate drops, it can switch over to the, to the hot standby. So in addition to that, it uses something called Quadrature Amplitude Modulation, or QAM, to modulate that, that multiplex stream onto a six megahertz frequency and then send it out across the coax cable. After that, an optical converter inside the hub site will actually convert it to light and send it over fiber cables and get it down closer to your neighborhood. And within the neighborhood, there's typically uh, another optical node that will convert it back to RF and send it across the coax cables down your street. So what comes across the cable in your house is actually just a series of streams broken up into six megahertz bands with up to 10 streams within each band, depending on whether high def or standard definition channels. And they're always a, a constant 38.8 megabits per second for one six megahertz band. So when you change the channel in your set top box, what you're really doing is actually turning to the radio frequency associated with the channel and then demultiplexing out the specific program within it. But the most important thing to know is this stream is always active across the wire. All the channels, all the time, and it's the same stream as, for you as it is your neighbors. 
And I know what you're thinking, what does any of this have to do with Kubernetes? <laughs> well, we find ourselves in the middle of a new transition, and that's from QAM-based QAM delivery of video to IP-based delivery of video. With the always-on nature of these streams, that cable is constantly pushing around three gigabits per second of data, depending on the neighborhood you live in. For, uh, I mean, just think about that. Three gigabits per second for all those channels. How many of your neighbors do you think are watching how many channels? It's, it's completely wasteful. Even when you're asleep. So this is completely different than the on-demand content we're used to consuming with things like Netflix or Hulu. So our newer set-top boxes are actually IP-based, and they retrieve the linear content on demand, which allows for only channels being watched to consume bandwidth. They use a technology called MPEG-DASH, which is Dynamic Adaptive Bit Rate Streaming over HTTP. It's a whole bunch of words, but we can sum it up with basically the set-top box, reaches out over HTTP, re uh, retrieves an XML manifest file that describes the stream, the different representations of it and formats, um, there'll be different versions of audio. And it'll go out and it'll fetch those segments in two second intervals. And then it'll continue to pull that manifest file looking for new uh, segments. So the primary motivator IP video is kind of like we said, that constant on nature is just wasteful for bandwidth. And by freeing up bandwidth, we can offer more content in more formats like 4K. And we can offer it to more devices like tablets and, and phones. And it provides us a ubiquitous IP network as opposed to like our proprietary network that only cable boxes are connected to. So, however, there's still millions of these QAM-based set-top boxes out there, and not, they're not going anywhere anytime soon. So that leaves us with, with a problem. While supporting both of these device types, we actually have duplicate uh, traffic for all of our content. We have the multicast UDB traffic for our QAM-based devices, and then we have the HTTP traffic for our IP-based devices. So the goal of our project is actually to replace this CAP1000 up in the head end that does the multiplexing with software that retrieves the content over the IP infrastructure but delivers it to the QAM infrastructure just as this, this uh, industry-specific hardware did. But the key point is we need to maintain the same five nines uptime that our current QAM infrastructure has because we all know what happens when you have a cable outage during your favorite show or sports game and nobody wants to deal with this guy. <laughs> so our QAM infrastructure is actually spread out over a thousand locations and managed by multiple geographically separated teams. And it's being replaced by more than 5,000 servers. So with an organization this size, many of the different regions and divisions have their own failover strategies and preferences and constraints as to uh, where the hardware and streams can exist due to kind of uh, rack availability, their own networking topology. So we need a solution with as little complexity so that we can hand it out to these teams, but as much consistency as possible so that we can kind of maintain kind of like a canonical approach. But we also need the versatility for them to be able to make some of the decisions on their own. So with a bit of history and high level understanding of the cable infrastructure, Let's take a quick look at our requirements. First, we must be highly available. There can be no single points of failure. And of which we also need to make sure that we have a hot, hot configuration of these uh, streamers so that in case a fiber gets cut, you would never know with UDP whether or not it's making it to its destination. And as I said, the administrators need to be able to decide where these streams end up based on their own processes and constraints. They need to be able to pick these things because like at some hub site locations you may have capacity for failover, but in others you may only be able to tolerate a minimal number of nodes failing before you need to fail up into say like a bigger regional data center at the cost of a little more, back, uh, a little more bandwidth across the backbone. We need static IP addresses because those Apex devices use something called source specific multicast, which they need to be pre-programmed with the IP address of this, the streamer that's going to be sending them their, their, their content. We also need to be able to update the stream configurations on the fly. We don't want channel outages just to make slight changes to the way the stream is working, Change, kind of twisting knobs for network jitter and things like that. We have real-time CPU constraints, and we can have absolutely no overcommitment 
of resources on a node because that would result in video degradations for all the channels that are being streamed from that node. We want deterministic updates of streamer software. We, we want to make sure that we're not updating channels during key prime moments for that specific channel. You know, as with anything we throw out into production, especially in the enterprise world, we need tools for debugging and monitoring and ops. All of that plays a role in it. It can't just serve the purpose well. We need to be able to continue to work with it. So when I start thinking about the system that we might need to build to solve these problems, there's only one thing that comes to mind. I mean, can you imagine trying to design a system like this from scratch, like using Zookeeper and your own homogenous pool of workers and writing your own scheduler? It'd be a massive effort, and it'd have a ton of edge cases. But it probably comes as no surprise standing here talking to you at a Kubernetes conference that Kubernetes has actually solved most of these problems for us. So let's take a quick look at how we implemented our solution. So first, using Kubernetes third-party resources, we can define our own stream resource that represents these multiplex channels. And so we have a spec file to manage that. And it has everything that we need to do that, it, uh, the individual knobs to turn for our multiplexing software, the dash URLs to fetch content from, the static IP address that our pod needs to contain. So this is actually submitted by a web user interface that we provide to our video engineering team into the Kubernetes API. Once it's submitted into the Kubernetes API, we have our own stream controller that watches the Kubernetes API for changes to these resources and reconciles the cluster based on the changes that it observes. First, the stream controller creates a config map. And the config map basically contains all of the information you saw in that little mux part of the, the stream spec, which is the, the configuration specific to that multiplex software. It also creates a replica set for our stream controller, mapping in the config map as a volume. The stream controller serves an additional role, which is that it continues to update status information on that, uh, on the stream resource, similar to the way that if you were to um, look at a replication controller or a, or a pod um, after it's already been deployed, you would see an additional value called status that has a lot more information about the, the container and things like that. And this allows us to not have to be worried about the Kubernetes primitives that make up this uh, stream that's out in the wild. But we can look to, we can, we can, all our systems can look only at the stream API. Kind of what version of software, the streaming software it's running, what's the current bit rate, how many bytes has this thing transferred since, since it's been deployed. So then within each pod, we have a sidecar process that we refer to as the streamer agent. So the streamer agent constantly monitors the config map volume looking for changes. And when it observes a change, it signals the streamer to reload its configuration from disk. And it also periodically pulls uh, the streamer over a shared socket to get metrics and push that out into our monitoring and alerting systems. Now, all we need to do to change a, a live uh, streamer is to submit uh, an updated stream spec and push it out to the Kubernetes API. The stream controller ends up reconciling our config map, and our, thanks to our agent, the streamer will reload its config. So if you recall, as a requirement, we talked about divisions and regions needing to make their own decisions about what hardware a particular stream is served from due to their own processes and constraints. And this is actually relatively simple to solve after the 1.4 release using nothing more than labels and annotations. We can define our CRAN as, a, as our cluster boundaries with different locations having a unique label. And I know this looks like this isn't typical practice, and I would agree with you. Cluster boundaries are usually drawn within a physical location, but we have a 1,000 locations, some of which with only a handful of nodes. And we also have the benefit of having our own backbones with redundant fiber between every connection. And all the locations within one cluster are fairly close geographically. Like in this cluster, this is really only the Seattle market. It only spans probably 30 or 50 miles in any direction. So first thing we can do is we can have the administrator label nodes they prefer a stream destined for a given ad zone with, with an ad zone one label set to primary. And then we can pick a location that may have more failover hardware because of, of rack space availability with an add zone two or an add zone one label set to secondary. 
We then only need to apply an annotation to the pod that our stream controller created. And this annotation designates first that a node is required to have an add zone one label with a value set to primary or secondary to be eligible for our stream to be scheduled on but is preferred to run on a node with an add zone one label set to primary. What this does is it allows us to ensure that our streams are never run from hardware that are not capable of reaching that add zone. And it allows us to best effort schedule it in the area that's closest to the edge for that customer, but fail up at the cost of bandwidth into a location. And an example of this is, is a small hub site may have a single blade server. So we could tolerate a couple nodes failing, but what happens if the whole chassis goes out? There's not enough rack space to have an entire uh, backup chassis there. But we can do better though. We don't want our redundant hot, hot pods to end up on the same nodes or even in the same location. This would create single points of failure. So with the release of 1.4, we now have functionality known as interpod affinity and anti-affinity. This allows us to further tweak our annotations so that we can require the pod to be scheduled onto a node that does not already have the same stream running on it and prefer that it doesn't get scheduled into a zone that's, that already has that stream running in there. And all of this is free just from applying the right labels and to our nodes and then adding annotations to our pods. This feature actually allowed us to remove our own scheduler completely. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't more than a couple months ago where we, had, we got to delete our whole idea of, of our own scheduler. But the power of this comes in administration because now the team responsible for managing these video streams get to focus on the part that matters to them. What channels are configured together? What are the formats that are going into it? What frequencies are these things getting multicast on? And they don't have to care about the underlying hardware and the team responsible for the hardware can change the hub sites that are responsible for an ad zone at will. If a new facility gets built or has more capacity, it's just a matter of shifting labels around. And this is a huge shift from the way things currently work. Today, the video engineering team needs to know about every single one of those CAP and APEX devices. They maintain spreadsheets of these things and log into them by IP address. So when a channel needs to move, they log into one cap device, remove it from that, log into another cap device, log it, update that, and then they log into the Apex device to change the source address of the cap device where it's coming from. And sometimes it even comes down to physically moving hardware or cables. And with the new Kubernetes implementation, they no longer need to be concerned with any of these details. It's just a matter of submitting a request for a stream telling the cluster what ad zone this needs to be broadcast to, and then letting the cluster do, what, do its thing. So we actually get a lot of free tooling too. And I'm a kube CTL guy. You won't hear me say kube cuddle, I'm sorry. <laughs> so we can use kube CTL just to get a list of streams. We, we can filter it down, get, trying to figure out what hosts are running particular channel lineups. I mean, we can do a search to see what's running an outdated version of our multiplexer software. We can t drain hosts so that we can take them down for maintenance. We're able to take a highly complex system with many constraints and turn it into a solution that's relatively straight, simple and straightforward. And there's tremendous beauty in that, but it's not without its stumbling blocks either. Our multiplexing process actually requires real-time threading in order to keep time. So we need to actually account for CPU real-time runtime. And one of the issues that we had is that um, in the resource quotas for both Kubernetes and Docker, this isn't accounted for. So we ended up in a, with a problem where every container starts up in its own C group. The C group defaults to zero, and our threads don't get upgraded to real-time. And then we, we, of course, have video degradation issues. Um, we ended up patching Docker to support these additional parameters. And we're, we're currently in the process of trying to patch Kubernetes as well. And there's a new effort by the SIG scheduler group um, that I think is going to come out of the 1.5 uh, release for opaque integer resources, which will allow us to supply generic um, amounts that a, of some generic resource that a node has, and then how much of that resource a pod consumes on the pod side. And we may be able to leverage that without having to do something completely specific. The other issue we have is source-specific multicast and networking. 
So as I said, the APEX requires that we already know what the IP address is, which means that we can't use the typical overlay network approach of basically assigning a block of IPs to a host, and then when a pod comes up, it gets an available IP. An IP needs to be pre-assigned for a channel lineup and ad zone combined, and no matter where it pops up in the cluster, it needs to always have that IP address. Otherwise, we're right back to having to log into those Apex devices and update them every time, and our ad insertion devices. We also need to leverage layer three routing so that our, with those IPs, they can move across those locations. Um, Bandwidth-based scheduling. Right now, we're currently just inflating our CPU and memory constraints so that we, we can ensure that we don't saturate a link on a blade. But it'd be nice if we could actually have networking knobs there too, where we can, where we can supply how much networking a pod consumes. Because in our case, it's always gonna be 38.8 megabits per second. But the thing that I'd really like to see is to be able to address these things at a much higher level. Because for instance, if we have a number of blades in a chassis, we may never saturate any single blade, but we may saturate the link in the chassis itself. So having, being able to control these things and having the scheduler more aware of that would definitely be a nice thing. But all in all, these are tiny issues in comparison to the complexity and edge cases of the system we would have had to create from scratch. And with each release of Kubernetes, there seems to be less work for our own components to do. There's no doubt that Kubernetes has changed the way we deploy and manage applications. And all the incredible talks that you've heard over the past two days are a testament to that. But Kubernetes can be just as impactful as a framework for building your own applications. You can save yourself complexity and development time by leveraging functionality and tools that already exist. We can also create clean abstractions between teams by writing our own resource types and controllers. It's a beautifully abstracted system, each component with a distinct role, making it effortless to replace components or customize them to fit our use cases. And even use cases that at their surface may not seem particularly suited for Kubernetes. Thank you. <laughs>